Hi, everyone. This is Rosemary Coates with the Reshoring Institute, and this is the Frictionless Supply Chain Podcast. I'm your host for today's event, and I am very excited to say I have a guest, uh, Stephanie Rodriguez with Colliers, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about her in a minute and then have her explain her background. Um, I am the executive director of the Reshoring Institute, where we help companies bring back or expand their manufacturing in the U.S., and I'm a contributing writer to Supply Chain Management Review. Today, I'm, I'm really delighted to have Stephanie Rodriguez. Um, she is the National Director of Industrial Services in the U.S. for Colliers, which is a commercial real estate company. Now, it may seem kind of odd or tangential to talk about commercial real estate on a supply chain process or a supply chain podcast, but not really. I mean, what we're talking about are facilities and things that supply chain people have to deal with every day. And I think it's time we learned a little bit more about the process and how, what kind of input and how we might be able to provide input to the people in our companies that are actually making a real estate decision. And so I think you'll find this quite interesting in terms of uh, what things go into that decision-making process. Of course, we're talking about manufacturing facilities, warehouses, trucks, truck terminals, and other buildings that are critical to the movement and production of products. And there's a lot to consider, including proximity uh, and accessibility to highways, building layout, et cetera. So supply chain professionals, we, we really ought to have a say or at least some input into selecting or building a facility. And we, I think we need to be involved in that decision. Just a small anecdote. Long, long ago, I worked for a defense contractor in San Diego, and on our property, they built a new headquarters building, which included a lot of labs. And it was a computer-related uh, company uh, making computer equipment in these labs and testing them. So we had to move computer equipment out of that facility on trucks. And <clears throat> whoever designed the building, I'm sure never saw a truck uh, before, had no idea about trucks. And uh, the dock area was not wide enough for an 18 wheeler to back into. So um, the truck had to jackknife in order to get flush with the dock. I mean, it was a mess and a very difficult situation. Had they asked me uh, to provide input before they started building, I would have told them there wasn't enough space. And so these kind of mistakes can be really, um, you know, a problem for supply chain people. And hopefully Stephanie can fill us in and educate us on this decision making process. So welcome, Stephanie. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So tell us about your background and how you got started in commercial real estate. Sure. I'll keep it brief since that's not what anybody really wants to know about. But uh, I got started about 25 years ago in commercial real estate, and I started in an entry-level role. I had no idea when I graduated from college with two liberal arts degrees. I didn't even know what commercial real estate was. I thought when someone said real estate, it was just selling houses. And um, so I started my journey at, as a receptionist and um, then eventually found my way into the operations side of the business, some more on the property management um, and maintenance side, transitioned into leasing. So I started working on the transactions and then ended up working in development. And I was focused in the second half of my career on solely industrial real estate. So I found my love and my passion in four concrete, most of the time concrete walls, and, um, you know, really enjoyed the whole journey. Um, I was the Florida market leader for a national industrial developer um, most recently until I came over to Collier's about a year ago. So that's sort of my background in, in uh, 60 seconds or less. Okay, that's great. So tell us about Collier's. What, what kind of things do you do? And tell us about the company a little bit. Sure. So we're a global diversified services um, firm and investment manager, asset investment manager. So we're talking about real estate. Um, we support developers, investors, landlords, tenants. Um, we generate property solutions to fit their needs and to help them grow their business over the long term. 
Um, in my current capacity as the National Director for Industrial Services for the U.S., I have the privilege of partnering every single day with roughly 700 brokers and internal consultants here at Collier's. And we advise our clients, both owners and occupiers of industrial real estate. So um, all of the things that I've done over my career has sort of culminated at this, at this moment. And it's a lot of fun because I have worked in every facet of, of this um, sector. So I sort of act as a, a conduit, if you will, to connect our clients with the appropriate solutions or tools or people resources that our firm can offer them so that they make some really good real estate decisions. Okay. Now, so Collier's isn't uh, probably a, a name that's well known to supply chain people, but I'm will, it's such a big company. I'm willing to bet that now everybody's going to notice when there are signs, Collier signs on buildings um, in their area. You know, you drive by somewhere and, and you'll see a Collier sign because uh, it's quite a, quite a large real estate company. It so is. let's, let's talk about site selection. So, which is, um, you know, really near and dear to my heart, having gone through the pain of having a uh, a difficult time with the loading dock. Um, so what kind of things do companies consider when they're making site selections? Yeah, it, it's funny. In your introduction, you sort of, uh, you very much teed up my answer to the question. Um, it's really important for an advisor like a broker at Collier's or somebody on our um, site selection consulting team to really understand the client's business and their growth plan in order to assist them in making, you know, their smart decisions when it comes to the real estate and the site selection. Um, sometimes we do this through a workshopping process where we pull together our own internal team of advisors to sit down with the occupiers team, including the people like you talked about, like the operations people are very important in that process because they're the ones who have to function in the space on a daily basis. Yeah, somebody it's who's not, seen a truck before. Somebody yeah. who's actually seen a truck. Yeah, right. yeah. Or or understands the equipment that sits in the warehouse that takes yeah. it off of the racks and puts it onto the truck. And how wide do those aisles need to be? And what does the column spacing need to look like? And all of those different things really come into play. And, and sometimes you see real estate decisions being made by CFOs which of course the financial aspects of those decisions are very important, but they have to be functional. And we help dig into that, you know, to answering those functionality questions so that we can better um, facilitate the selection of the location. So we look, you know, we ask questions about things like, what are your priorities when it comes to site, site location? Proximity to ports, airports, do you need rail access? Um, what are the roads and what are the access points to the site themselves? I, mean, I, I worked on a project years ago as a developer where there were no paved roads to three brand wow. new buildings that we, we constructed. I mean, you talk about selling a dream, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Roads are coming, we swear. Um, and they did, they did come, but it was a long and arduous process. So having, you know, an understanding of those things and 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 how important they are to the process. We look at things like resources, especially when it comes to manufacturing now. Is excessive power available? What about water supply? You know, if if it's a, a use that highly, highly uh relies upon above standard water capacity, is it available to the building? What about labor? Do you need skilled labor? Do you need educated? Yeah. Have just, you know, guys who are really just loading pallets. Um, we have become an increasingly automated society. And so our labor is shifting. And, you know, how does that play into your use in the facility? And then, you know, things that you don't think about, but when it comes to automation, so much is is run by computers now. So is there fiber that comes to the property? Right. And what about redundancy? If you have one carrier and all of a sudden they go down, it could halt your operation for hours or days. So is there redundant service available? 
when it's mission critical to your business. So those are some of the things that we look at. And one of the newer things that has recently come into question with the economic uncertainty we're sitting in and the fact that some buildings are financed and interest rates have increased is what's the financial wherewithal of the landlord? You know, who are, who, if we are renting space, who is the owner of the building and do they have the staying power to support our business? So those are just a few of the high level things that, you know, we kind of dig into deeper with the client. Yeah, I think, you know, you touched on a theme that I, we've seen in supply chain for for quite a while. I mean, I would say probably since the early 90s when we started implementing ERP systems, and that's this idea of cross-functional information. So we don't operate in silos so much anymore, although some would argue with me that 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 still exists, but you know, a lot of the different functions in a company are talking to one another and understand what each other's needs are. And that's um, you know, really important to be able to provide that kind of input so that there's a clear knowledge and the best decision is being made. And then also, you know, I know at the Reshoring Institute, we've done site selections for a number of companies. And um you know, while if the CFO is leading, you know, you always look for the, the lowest cost area or um, the lowest tax rates, um, that sort of thing. And it might end up in some rural location, but there's, you know, limited access to highways or the nearest airport is two hours away or something like that, which so the supply chain people are going to know that information and be able to provide that kind of input and, and, um, and, hopefully avoid making location decisions that aren't going to play out well. And the other thing you touched on was labor. Um, Super, super important. Um, It's not going to be helpful if you locate a 2 million square foot warehouse in the middle of nowhere and then there are no employees, right? So looking at labor markets and, um, and, uh, you know, the availability of labor to work in your facility is really Im- important to supply chain people as well. Um, so just, you know, this is kind of a continuation on that theme is just last week, an economist from the Bank of America uh, said that we are entering a manufacturing super cycle. And so that really caught my attention. In fact, I just wrote a column for it on supply chain management review, but that really caught my attention. And the reason why he said this is because over the last 30 years, there's been about uh, uh, under under investment in manufacturing um, because a lot of manufacturing is moving offshore and so forth. But with the three big acts that have been passed by uh, by um, Congress in the last two years, so there's, first of all, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is focused on green energy. There's a lot of green energy funds available. The Chips and Sciences Act, and then the uh, Infrastructure Act. All three of those have got are going to infuse billions, billions of dollars into the U.S. economy. And that is almost all related to manufacturing of some kind or another. So what this economist was saying is, you know, brace yourself because we've got a big wave coming in terms of a manufacturing super cycle, uh, which means we're going to need a lot more real estate, right? Is that what you're seeing too? We we are. And I will, as much as I hate to be the, the bearer of Well, to tamper enthusiasm, let's call it, (laughs) Um, you know, there's a caveat to everything, but we are seeing an increase in activity in the manufacturing sector. Construction of manufacturing facilities, based on the research we've done this year, has doubled um, over prior years. So we are seeing an uptick in this. You mentioned a few of the drivers, the acts passed by Congress. We you know, a lot of the deals that we have been personally involved in, in some regions, battery production, solar panel manufacturing, things that are directly correlated to um, the green energy and, and, and that sort of situation. Then we've got, you know, Arizona with chips. Now, Taiwan Semiconductor delayed their facility in Phoenix by a year 
because they're having a labor issue. So I, I would think they're going to have a water issue also. Semiconductors well, I, use a lot of water. Yeah, but they've they've addressed those issues and kind of gone beyond that with their plans. Um, but now it's it's a labor question, and that's been highly publicized as well. And it goes right back to our first point where site selection, it is so important to fully understand where you place that facility um, so that it can be supported with the appropriate workforce. And so I think, you know, we've seen a lot of this manufacturing uptick, but the labor is going to be driving the, the long-term gains on that front. So um, it's really goes back to really making sure that we're considering the availability of the labor force um, as we put those manufacturing facilities across the U.S. Yeah, um, so, you know, we're we're at historically low levels in unemployment. So, <laughs> you know, there's, there's still a few million jobs out there um, that are open, but they require skills that our workers don't necessarily have. And yeah. so pretty much everybody who wants a job is working right now um, or potentially has opportunities very shortly in the future, those people who are out of work. And so, um, you know, this is going to be a problem if we have this super cycle coming at us where we've got uh, more manufacturing coming back to the U.S. We don't necessarily have the skills, like you said, um, you know, we're moving toward a more automated environment. So we're we're not looking for minimum wage people to put pegs in holes. We're right. looking for a higher skilled, higher paid workers who run robots that put the pegs in holes. So it's a different kind of uh, manufacturing environment, labor shortage. And obviously that's going to affect um, site selection. So you might look for a, a larger market where there's more available labor um, and it will also surely drive up wages. Agreed. Agreed. Um, you know, the other thing that we that ties into the, the onshoring or reshoring of our manufacturing is during COVID, there was a, a lot, as you know, supply chain disruption. And yes. businesses are now very seriously contemplating, even if they don't bring all of their manufacturing back to the U.S. or to Canada or to Mexico or somewhere closer out of China, maybe, um, they're looking to bring some component of it so that they don't yeah. have a repeat of that situation. So I, I think large or small, we're going to see a, a, a mix of the two um, coming either closer to the U.S. or on our shores again. So yeah, I think, you know, reducing long global supply chains is, uh, you know, taking um uh, taking down your carbon footprint, reducing your carbon footprint. And right. that's on everybody's agenda is um, uh, sustainability projects. That's on every CEO's agenda. And so, you know, that works hand in hand with reshoring. And we're also seeing an awful lot of companies that are going to Mexico. And um, because the labor rates in Mexico, especially central Mexico, are some of the lowest in the world, way lower than China, for sure. Uh, so companies are considering Mexico as a very viable alternative. And I would think that that would um, relate to a lot of warehousing on the U.S. side of the border and transit facilities and so forth. Are you seeing a lot of development along the border? We are. We're seeing an uptick of activity in those border towns, um, you know, Laredo, Austin, H I mean, Houston. There's a lot going on in Texas and even in um, California as it borders the peninsula there. So, you know, we have some brokers who recently earned some assignments for potentially three million square foot industrial parks in border towns. Uh, because there is a demand for the same reason that you just mentioned. So, so we think that that's going to continue to drive the industrial sector growth in those border, border towns and those regions, just because it, it makes perfect sense to have distribution coming out of Mexico to those locations and then throughout the country. 
It was a, a lot to be prepared for um, if this super cycle really materializes and it's likely to do that. And it's my understanding that even though there are billions of dollars that are set aside for developing um, green energy and EV battery charging stations and all of that, a lot, a lot of manufacturing, um, the funds are just starting to trickle in right now. So it'll probably be a couple of years before we really see that boom happen. But there's certainly a lot to consider and a lot to sort of be afraid of. I mean, I don't know how, you know, with unemployment so low and, um, you know, the demand very high, um, it's going to be tough to address all these issues. I think we're going to see a lot of a lot of busy activity over the next couple of years. Yeah, for sure. And I think some of it will be a matter of educating the workforce that we have and modernizing their yes. knowledge base. You know, so what they may be sticking the the peg in the hole and now they need to learn how to operate a robot. So let's educate the workforce and help them evolve as we evolve, you know, as a modern society. And I think that's part of the answer, but it's certainly going to be a really long process. And I don't think anybody expects we're going to see, you know, instantaneous results um, or just an immediate boom to the cycle. Yeah, I agree. We like to say it's not your grandfather's manufacturing. That's so right. My, my grandfather worked at Hazy Taylor in Warren, Ohio. It's a metal uh, fabrication company that makes drinking fountains. And 50 years ago, he used to come home and he was smelly and sweaty and he was a metal worker. You know, he worked yeah. in a in a kind of a hot, dirty environment. That's not the way manufacturing is anymore. Now it's, no. you know, the manufacturing shop floor is full of computers and people's skills are different and they have to communicate in different ways. And they watch different things happening and it's it's a totally different kind of environment requiring a different skill level and different education and so forth. So all these things are important trends to watch and certainly in parallel with a real estate development for sure. Yeah, yeah. My two grandfathers worked in brickyards. So okay. they made bricks and in Pennsylvania, and neither of them had a high school degree. I mean, they none of them went past elementary school. So it's it's definitely a different world we live in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Surprisingly, uh, manufacturing today requires a lot of mathematics skills. So there are angles and planes and uh, different things that you work on that you wouldn't necessarily think of as being uh, math, but they certainly are. Uh, right. And so the education is, the educational requirements are different and shifting as well. So we, we say that, um, you know, we don't have an employment problem in the U.S. We have a skills problem in the U.S., which no, is a whole good. another topic. Yeah, whole another for topic. Sure. So Stephanie, any closing thoughts or any last things you want to advise of people in the supply chain about, about real estate that we can find helpful? Yeah. I mean, I think it's just important to kind of employ all the resources at your, at your disposal and, and to work with, with experts who understand the different nuances that go into selecting good real estate. Um, you know, of course, I'd love it if it was always Collier's. I know it's not, but I think that, you know, it, it's really critical to make sure that you're making a good choice. And to do that, you need to rely on, on people who can advise you um, in all the different areas that you may not have thought about and and just really utilize the, the resources that are out there. Terrific. Thank you so much for joining us today, Stephanie. It was really, really interesting. I appreciate it. I think all the supply chain people listening to the podcast have learned something new, which is great. Uh, and hopefully we can participate in those kind of real estate decisions in the future. Can you give us your contact information if somebody wants to reach out to you? Sure. Um, you can find me on the Collier's website at colliers.com and look under industrial services when it goes to the services we provide. And my email is stephanie.a.rodriguez at colliers.com. And I'm also on LinkedIn. So oh, I, I do a lot of uh, postings there on a daily basis, just industry related uh, articles and things like that. So I look forward to connecting. 
Super. Thank you so much. And you can listen to more frictionless supply chain podcasts posted on supply chain management reviews, landing page, Apple podcasts, Google podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can reach me, Rosemary Coates at rcoates at reshoringinstitute.org and visit our website at www.reshoringinstitute.org where we publish all of our research on manufacturing in America. Thanks everyone and have a great day.